So why don't we assemble our medical panel and we can have some, uh, Joseph can continue to answer questions here. Dr. Ruzzi, I think you're going to join us, and Ellen, and uh, Felicia, if she's still here, can join us. Um, somebody can find Felicia, that would be helpful. And Julie, I think, is going to be coming to uh, help us moderate the panel today. She's petting a dog right now. I can see. So we are going to go for about 30 or 40 minutes with uh, our panelists. Do you want to do, do you want to, I have the bios here too. So we have. started and um, I'll just do kind of a brief introduction. Oh, so first of all, let's do a round of applause for Dr. Morgan, which is great. Speech that he has So we'll try to, uh, we're going to try to get Dr. Morgan's uh, slides copyrighted and then we'll get them up online for people who want to look at them. Okay, so like I said, I'll just do a brief introduction. You met a couple uh, people already today. Um, and then the, I'll just kind of make two bullet points that I think are very important, like kind of a public service announcement. And then basically the panel discussion is going to be open for your questions. And if you don't feel comfortable standing up and asking questions, we'll pass around paper that you can write down your questions on. And we hope to be able to just answer your questions. So Dr. Morgan, we got to meet already. He gave his lovely, very informative speech. So that's Dr. Morgan here, the first one. And the second person sitting there is Ellen. She is a nurse practitioner and works in a dispensary. Um, and then we have Dr. Abruzzi, who is um, also a recommending doctor with Herbal Wellness Rx. And we have Felicia that we also hopefully got to hear her just talking this morning. If not, I could definitely talk to her throughout the day. And she is with Reboot um, Physical Therapy. So that is our medical panel for the day. Um, and like I said, most of this is hopefully going to be your questions answered. Okay, so um, just kind of the points that I would like to make. Um, I am a nurse and I work in a hospital and so I just want people to be aware if you are using medical cannabis um, for your daily maintenance with your health and wellness, if you do need to go to a hospital or you do need to be admitted to a hospital, just make sure that you kind of know their policies on that. Um, because there are hospitals that are open to that and there are hospitals that are very closed to that. So just kind of, like I said, a public service announcement um, to just be aware of what's out there. Um, and then the other kind of thing I wanted to speak about real quick is that um, you know, you cannot overdose on cannabis, okay? You can overconsume and feel a little uncomfortable, okay? You're not going to die. <laughs> so don't waste your money going to the emergency department. I work in the emergency department. And what I'm gonna tell you is to relax, drink water, eat some food, take a hot shower. Um, CBD is also another thing that can block some of the receptors for you. So if you have CBD on hand and you feel uncomfortable, that might be able to help you as well. Um, also, I am a, you know, a medical cannabis educator. My card is up there, so if you have somebody who is concerned about first use or something, I'm available to help with that as well. Okay, so 
from this point, I'd like to kind of get you guys going with questions, hopefully, that you would like answered by our medical professional. And you can raise your hand if you'd like to write a question on a card, or if you want to just stand up and go ahead and ask your questions. So I turn the floor over to you, and we have Linda. Do you want to write your question down, or? Okay. Um, Felicia, I missed the part of your talk, so you might have already addressed this, but um, I have lots of arthritis pain and missing cartilage in my knees, and would this help? Thank you. So that is a great question. Um, I think yes, the answer is yes. And I think then finding the right product, um, speaking with the people at the dispensaries, the referring physician, um, speaking with people like me, Julie, who are cannabis educators, of finding what the right prescription would be for you. Something with CBD actually has a lot of anti-inflammatory principles. But there are so many other terpenes and cannabinoids that that's where having the knowledge of what um, CBD does, um, CBG is good for certain types of inflammation in the body, there's CBC, CBN, there's so many, and there's so many that they're just starting to get the research done on in the other countries and starting to happen here. So the more we know about the other cannabinoids that would help with the inflammation and the pain, you know, then you would have like a fuller spectrum. But I think um, having a little bit of THC is really helpful because it opens the receptors. And once the receptors are open, then the CBD can bind to it. So that's the difference between just getting a traditional CBD that you could get at Whole Foods or at a Whole Food, uh, health food store versus something that you're getting in the dispensary. And I always guide people first to go to get the card and go to the dispensary so you're getting a medicine that you're being watched, you know, you know where it came from, you know from seed to sale, how it's been um, tested, that it's organic, things like that. Another question? Oh, good. Thank you. Hello. I would like to know why more people aren't advocating medical marijuana for alcohol harm reduction. I think that should be a qualifier right there. Alcohol harm reduction is a big problem in this country. I think that medical marijuana can do something for that benefit. Can somebody tell me anything? I'll be Third very thing. happy to address that. First of all, I agree 100%. Um, the author of this book, Dr. Todd Nikuria, was a Philadelphia psychiatrist who worked at the National Institute of Mental Health in 1965 on their marijuana program and left saying they kept on wanting me to say bad things but because I had access to the older medical literature which he copied and then published from the 1890s on um, showed how useful cannabis was for treating alcoholism. Alcoholism used to be called dipsomania. Cannabis was advertised by American pharmaceutical companies as a treatment for dipsomania in the early 1900s. So the answer is yes, Dr. Micaria did the research. There are some drug and alcohol facilities that allow cannabis, particularly CBD, for treating alcoholism. Now, the reason why it's not more popular is because the alcohol rehab industry, which I used to work within, wants to make money. Seven day detox. And if you have the right insurance, magically you qualify for a 30 day stay for rehab. And if you have even better insurance, magically you qualify for six months or three months. And if you don't have the right insurance, magically it's not medically indicated. I haven't figured that one out. Okay, uh, so if cannabis can be an outpatient therapy for it,
in this whole industry, which is a billion dollar industry, with all these lobbyists, is going to lose some money. Now, then you run, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for Alcoholics Anonymous. I am not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I've read enough AA literature to understand that AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, kind of views other substances historically as if they're mind-altering, uh, other than, you know, other than coffee and cigarettes. If they're mind-altering, um, you know, they pose danger. So I think you're working with the stigma, and I think as the research is done, that's an issue. Now, for some people, cannabis can be an entry drug. For some people, cannabis can trigger an abstinent alcoholic to relapse into alcoholism. You don't want that to happen. But for others, it can be a substitute for alcohol. Therefore, I think you have to work with doctors, with, with other therapists, um, um, and, and experimental in one's own. That's really the best I could give now. I would also say write to Dr. Levine um, uh, with your ideas. Propose it to the State Medical Cannabis Board. If they ask me in my university, I'll be 100% supportive. Um, the state just came up with a new form. You can uh, submit new things that you think that it should be a qualifying condition for medical marijuana. It's on the medical marijuana PA.gov page. Great. I don't know if everybody heard that, but I'll just make sure. The, the Pennsylvania Department of Health page has apparently a new area where you can recommend reasons why medical cannabis could work um, and be a qualifying you Department must, of Health. You must fill out the form. They don't waste send a bunch of emails saying, oh, I think this should be it. <laughs> <laughs> can I say something? Please. I think... Um, what Dr. Morgan said about AA and uh, not wanting people to use any other substances when they're sober and sobriety, counting like the days of sobriety, the years of sobriety, and people in that mindset are thinking you're breaking sobriety. And so it's one of those things that's kind of a gray area and it doesn't mean that's not positive. But I think that's just the way it's looked at right now. And we are absolutely looking to change to make cannabis as medicine and not looked at as a drug. We're trying to end the war on drugs. Um, it has caused more problems than it's worth. Yes, Molly. Just, uh, how do you find it? Remember or, when you were saying some hospitals are, I guess, 420 friendly <laughs> somewhere. Um, how, what's the best way to find that out other than just calling it arbitrary? Sure, yeah, right on Eaton. Okay, great. Uh, my, my colleague and fellow faculty member of the University of Sciences, Dr. Christine Roussel, a hospital pharmacist, was just, elect, is just elected president of the Pennsylvania Hospital Pharmacy Association. Well, she wrote the first hospital policy for the acceptance of medical cannabis before it was even legal. That was at Doylestown Hospital, and that was under the pediatric safe harbor so that pediatric patients uh, for seizure disorders, et cetera, could have continuity of care. So she's a very responsible pharmacist and will do what she can to advocate on a statewide level for cannabis to play its rightful place once again in hospital pharmacy. Everyone is um, working in the cannabis industry or at a dispensary. Do you have a special certification? Did you go to school? Did someone say, how do you get certified to work? Like, how? Do you can Dr. Griffey answer that? Um, so first, you have to have an interest and a passion in this, obviously. As a physician, um, the state requires that you take a certain number of CME credits or obtain those credits. Um, and then once you do that, you then become one of their certifying physicians. Um, most of us take it beyond that and do a lot of education on our own. Um, I'll be very transparent that the amount of education that the state requires a physician to obtain is very, very minimal. And that's probably why so many people go to their doctors 
and find that the doctors certifying them but not educating them. And that's because the doctors, most or many I should say, don't have a lot of education about this. So from a physician's perspective, I, I think that the amount of education that we're required to obtain to be able to certify patients should be much greater than it is. Um, so that's just from a physician's perspective. And what about working in the dispensary? I can answer. Well, part of it. Okay. All right, I'm just going to say that the, oh, the dispensaries that we really stand behind are educating their staff. There are um, programs out there, you know, hemp staff is one of them where you can get a certification and learn about cannabinoids and learn about, you know, the different effects and and it's a very thorough program. Um, well, go ahead, Ellen, please add to it. So I was just going to say the same thing as Sarah, but add that um, you learn a lot every single day at work, obviously, and um, that's the that's the best kind of knowledge and then reading and attending um, different kind of programs, but um, I work at Keystone Shops and um, all of the staff there is incredibly knowledgeable. When a patient comes for uh, the first time, we have a separate room that we that either me or Beth is a, a pharmacist and we take the um, person or and their family or whoever they want to come in and we talk about um, the different products and what might be best for them and it's it's uh, a lot of it is patient driven but um, which is a little bit different than regular medicine where the doctor will give you a prescription for what you need we want to know what you want what you need the whole person what kind of product would be the best for the person? Uh, for example, some people don't want to inhale anything, and there's a lot of different options, such as tinctures, um, capsules, um, or different oils. So, um, do they have any bags, things that are Yes, yes. There's pain cream that has THC, and there's also pain cream with CBD which I never would have thought would have worked, but um, I've been really happily surprised to see how many patients really respond well with pain cream. And can I just add a real quick thing to that about pain cream? We actually, our app today, I don't know if we've been talking too much about that, but we do have different pamphlets around where you can scan and get the app. And in the app we have ways where you can actually make your own cannabis oil and other things where you can make your own things. A little more affordable than in dispensary. Yes. Um, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Um, Ellen, you said you work at shop as well. Keystone shops. Uh, well, the question I have is, I know someone who has a son with Asperger's, and the pediatrician, he's a little older now, the pediatrician told her she has a card for herself, a medical card, she doesn't live in Pennsylvania. The pediatrician said to give him a couple of drops of CBD oil, and she does, and it really helps him. But she can't tell anybody, because it's illegal to give kids that kind of medication. But it's sad, because it really helps them. So I wanted somebody to speak on why they don't use it for uh, children who have certain problems that CBD oil really calms them down. Well, in Pennsylvania, children can use cannabis if they're approved with autism. And Marianne Dilberto, who, who is back in the Thank corner, you. Thank you. is a nurse at CHOP, and she and a physician at CHOP um, are doing a study uh, an observational study of children with autism and cannabis and I've seen many children in, in the dispensary that it helps 
So it's just unfortunate if she lives in a different state and it's not legal there, but probably it will be at some point. Well, it's legal, but she's, it's legal in her state, but her doctor said, don't talk, you know, the psychologist and the psychiatrist said, don't talk about it. She could always look for another doctor, I'm too. Just, you know. I know, well, it's, I but it's hard. It. It's really hard for people when they have a doctor who there is their child's physician for seizure disorder or um, autism to tr find someone else. So that's an easier thing to just say, find another doctor, yeah. than it is to do in reality. Thank you. What are the current um, diagnoses that are allowed? Well, we're up to 21 of them now. Um, so I, I actually have, I'm sure there's paperwork floating around with the conditions on there. But they range from um, cancer, even cancer in remission, chronic pain, neuropathies, things like HIV and sickle cell, um, Parkinson's, autism like we spoke of, multiple sclerosis. So we're hoping for some more to be added in the next year or so. So there's there's quite a list, and it covers a lot. Um, PTSD is another one, um, and opioid addiction is one as well. Is that a state list, or is that a yes, state? Yes, every state has their own list, and they differ. So for example, anxiety is approved in New Jersey, and it's not an approved diagnosis in Pennsylvania, not yet at least. Here the qualifying conditions. I have a few questions. One, go back to the salve. The salve, is that for arthritis that you're rubbing in would take care of arthritis? So. Yeah, so some people use it for arthritis pain, spasms, nerve, you know, nerve pain, so any type of pain. All right, and back to the autism point. Oh, well, I'll just jump in for that part. Um, as a physical therapist, when patients come into my office, if they have their own card, they can bring their own lotion, and I use that as part of their treatment. So it can then legally be incorporated into a treatment program. I've been treated in the past for pain, but I'm, you know, they did all they could and said, okay, you're on your own. And as I spoke about earlier, I think, unfortunately, people are going to have a certain level of pain. I think the expectation to live in a pain-free life is uh, not a realistic goal. And so I think then the, the conversation has to shift to live a functional life, to live with as much pain-free symptoms as you can. But to be able to get to do, you know, your everyday activities, your activities of daily living, as best as you possibly can. But I think we need to shift our thinking a little bit about that pain. Like you're either at a zero or you're at a ten, and you know, people like don't know how to read that scale when you go to a doctor. Zero being no pain, five is strong, ten's going to the hospital, and everybody's going to say I'm around a seven or an eight because that's what we've been programmed to say go to your doctor to get your prescriptions filled, you have to say I'm in a high level of pain. So I want to kind of shift that thinking a little bit. And to the autism point, I have a son that takes a pill every morning. And what would be the treatment there? It's replace that with uh, drops? So I will, I will hand that over. Um, from, you know, my perspective is, it is about trying to, you want to, you want to keep your medications and see how you can bring cannabis into that. Um, we would never up here say, you know, stop taking your pill tomorrow and put something else in its place. This is a this is a dialogue that you have with your physician, with your certifying physician, with your dispensary staff, and no one would be saying stop taking your pain or your medication for what your son's taking it for. Yeah. I think the other thing would be um, what symptoms or pr problems are you trying, to, are you hoping will be helped? So, so that's how we look at it a little bit. Yeah, well, that's kind of a good problem. Yeah. That we, but we would um, sit down and, and talk to you, like Felicia said, you're with your, you would talk to your son's physician 
in a certifying doctor in, in the dispensary, we would help you try to find something that would help with the symptoms. Right. Well, my hope would be get them off the meds. And, and eventually that may be a possibility, right? We gotta start slow and see. Because, well, with and without, you can see the difference with and without. Mm -hmm. So it's a big. Long so we're going to have, you know, the doctors is in tables, there's three of them active, so I think that uh, maybe a one-on-one -on -one session, speaking with them a little more um, further throughout the day for questions um, that need a little more detail. And I'm sorry, one person has been waiting for a question back here, and then we'll get to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, is the cannabis industry doing anything about damages of vaccine? Call about vaccine? I actually have two questions. Um, in my bill, in the maritime industry, in the maritime. What you have to say is that. Discussed over. Is the cannabis industry doing anything about vaccines? Damages caused by vaccines. And also, um, there's two different questions I have. Another question. You know what I really think. Uh, the cannabis industry should not be involved in any way, shape, or form with the vaccine industry, period. It's two totally different things. Having said that, if individuals have damage, damages to their health that they attribute to vaccines, I think that cannabis can be explored, whether legally or not legally, as a potential therapeutic in managing the signs and symptoms, period. Now, the second question I have, I work in the maritime industry, and they do not allow um, recreational or medicinal um, and cannabis. And um, it helps me, and it does, with mental health, PTSD, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what should I do? in that area. You know, the Coast Guard is regular about the Coast Guard and um, other DOT companies. Do you get urine testing? Yes, I do. Yeah. Urine tested, saliva, here. Depends on the vessel. great question and unfortunately it affects so many people. It affects people that work in a hospital system oftentimes in jobs where they're using heavy equipment and machinery um, and unfortunately at the VA you can't even discuss cannabis because it's still federally illegal. So you have all these veterans that are coming back with PTSD and pain and so many diagnoses that would be beneficial and they can't get the help that they need. So I think, unfortunately, until it becomes federally legal, we're going to be limited in what we can do. And then it's up to, you know, individual employers to decide what kind of standards they want to have. So if they're, you know, a more flexible environment and you have a cannabis card, that may be where you need to end up if you want to be able to still take your medicine and, you know, work at that place. But it ultimately goes to the highest authority is your employer and what they decide their employees is what you have to go by. And you don't have any protection by having the card. You can't say, well, I have a card, so I should be able to. It doesn't work like that. It goes by what they want. Thank you. I'm on my way. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, the first one is, is cannabis seen as more protective for developing Alzheimer's and other dementias at this point? Um, and then my second question is, is it being used at all with any of the um, symptoms of Lyme disease? Are there any, anybody seeing any benefit in that area? Um, if cannabis is being seen as being oh, see. more and is neuroprotective, for yeah, us. cannabis is completely neuroprotective. The the uh, public health literature shows.
people who are involved in motor vehicle trauma, if they test positive for marijuana, have better outcomes. There's a federal patent. Cannabis is any, I'm sorry, cannabinoids is antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Federal patent in, uh, in uh, 2006 uh, issued to uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that, that uh, show the neuroprotection. It was on that basis that I instituted my own research, which is cannabis to protect against chemical war nerve agents. So cannabis is incredibly neuroprotective against traumatic brain injury. I have heard the Israeli army issues sublingual sprays of cannabis to medics that are administered during battlefield trauma, but they don't want to publicly talk about it. Oh yeah, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the National uh, Football League, uh, also National Hockey League with Riley Cote, who's local, a former Philadelphia Hockey uh, Flyers coach, very active in, in using cannabis. Uh, I'm going to say the work of uh, Yosef Sarni, chairman of uh, physiology and pharmacology at Sacra School of Medicine in Tel Aviv University, shows that ultra low doses of THC, one one thousandth the dose that's therapeutically used, whether it's given a few days before or even a few days after a traumatic brain injury, will decrease the injury. I've administered um, CBD to my daughter who fell off a skateboard. My daughter's the straightest engineer in the world. Um, and, and, and she had a complete recovery. So cannabis to treat stroke, to treat multiple sclerosis, to treat traumatic brain injury, it's all in the federal patent of 2006. You can look up cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Yeah, the book uh, Marijuana Gateway to Health is all about the research of cannabis to prevent Alzheimer's and, um, and more and more evidence is showing that that is indeed the case. Uh, neuro neuroprotective um, marijuana gateway to health is, is that major book. All right, we have a question over here. I was wondering if there's been any research for low-dose naltrexone in combination with CBD for those that can't take any medical cannabis and they're fearful of having urine testing indicate a problem because the low-dose naltrexone has to be compounded by a pharmacy. It's off-label loose, but they're using it now. I was wondering if you had any like insight in that. Well, is there, is there what, what is the indication, the low dose, low dose one tenth of the dose naltrexone is being used right now for fibromyalgia, but what is the indication you're thinking of CBD and low dose naltrexone? I was just thinking for autoimmune, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm just asking because they, some people want to use cannabis and if they can't, they'll try CBD and then maybe layer low dose naltrexone for maybe fibromyalgia pain. Just to see, I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there to see if that was something that there was researched. Is, um, there was presentations on that already, American College of Physicians, of uh, low-dose naltrexone. Uh, people with fibromyalgia should avoid opioids. There's too many circulating opioids, and there's an extreme sensitivity to touch stimulation that is not particular painful to others can be extremely painful to people with fibromyalgia and it's thought that it's related to being too much um, endorphins, endogenous morphine substances in, the, in one board. So low dose naltrexone might be useful for that. I think this is a great conversation for an individual and for their neurologist, but since hemp-based CBD is legal, uh, I don't see any reason not to try an experiment. It won't do any harm. Uh, so much medicine is advanced because people are willing to try their own experiments. All right, thank you so much. Stay tuned for more questions. So uh, I think probably most of my question has already been answered. So I am the business owner of a home care agency. We provide private duty, non-medical home care services to seniors and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. 
I am my caregiver staff, they're in the homes of individuals every single day that have been diagnosed with dementia and they're considering dementia as the next silver tsunami. And I'm just wondering, just from an advocacy perspective, like are there groups or anyone that's advocating on behalf of seniors who's having this conversations, this conversation with their loved ones as a business owner? Is there a way for me to get involved or initiate this conversation? Like it, it's 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 not as growing and growing and growing. There are entire communities that are built specifically for individuals with um, some form of dementia. I think that's a great. Um, there's great opportunity in the future for this kind of thing, and that's one thing I was thinking when I started working at the dispensary was how can I help older people who live in long-term care facilities. Um, I, I think there's just, it's wide open and you're right in the position to be helping and if you advocate and tell your patients and their families that they can get um, uh, evaluated to see if this would help them, I, I think that, that it's, it's just going to help elderly individuals. Can I just add in about the Compassionate Caregiver Program? Um, Sheena Roberts will be here later today. She's going to be on our industry panel. She is headwaying the Compassionate Caregiver Program for exactly something like that, where you can get all your staff trained to be able to educate. So that is available, through, and she'll be here later today. I don't know if we got a clear answer to that question. Does marijuana help dementia? It can cause dementia and it can treat dementia. Let me answer. Marijuana to me means little Mary. That's what marijuana means. It's a substance purported to contain, to contain cannabis. I have no idea what's in marijuana. I know 80% of samples test positive for neurotoxic pesticides. Neurotoxic pesticides cause dementia. Marijuana causes dementia. However, cannabis can treat dementia. Some studies in nursing homes in Israel show that patients with Alzheimer's disease become engaged, less violent, don't need to be restrained. And there are facilities that allow medical cannabis uh, the, the, the New York Jewish Home for the Aged allows medical cannabis. This was written up in Forbes magazine by Abby Rosner, a local journalist. It's in Forbes last week. You can get Forbes online. Look it up. So um, more and more cannabis will be used as a treatment for Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And uh, there's evidence that it could also prevent it. Okay, we have another question over here. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, I have a bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD. Um, I take medication for it. I'm sorry. It's, nothing really, like, helps, you know, with it. And it's very frustrating to take all this medication knowing that it doesn't, you know, really do anything or gives me side effects. Like uh, a cathedra I had, I can't move my legs. And I have started just smoking and not in that kind of way to go to bed because I couldn't sleep. I mean, almost a week sometimes. And I tried and it helped. It helped me get to sleep. It helped me with my anxiety, you know, and I believe that it's that. I just, you know, is it good for like the mental, the bipolar, the kind of those like debilitating things because they're debilitating, you know? And people don't think they're debilitating. People just think it's a problem in your head and they can't see it like a cut on the arm. So it's a uh, hard to. Um, I, will, I will just start by saying I just want to thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing with this group that you are 
you are going through it. You, you are not alone, and um, you are not alone. And so, while you know, we will share about how cannabis can help, and it may help, and it may not. It's not perfect. It's not like. It's not the be-all and end-all, and that's where, for you, what I would recommend is let's start talking about some other things. Let's talk about some mindfulness. Let's talk about some breathing, how to like manage the pain so when it peaks up, you have a way to kind of know it's going to come down. How to maybe do some other modalities, such as uh, the physical therapy, or a heating pad, or listening to theta waves or binaural beats, like other things that you can do as right. well as that, because sounds like you have a lot on your plate. Well, the doctors, though, none of them, they hear about me. And I tell them, honestly, I'm trying to everybody. And so I wanted to sign up, and nobody, they heard of it. Nobody knows too much about how to go. Luckily, I was sick at the emergency room, and we just heard <laughs> I just wanted to say one thing um, that you sort of answered your own question when you were saying that you were having certain problems and it's helping. So that's all you need to know, really. Yeah. Thank you so much. Julie, can I just add one point? Um, Absolutely. You know, just remember that if the doctors that you're seeing aren't supportive of this, aren't knowledgeable, you can go to another physician for the certification. It doesn't have to be your primary care doctor, your neurologist, your psychiatrist. They, you don't need permission. This is you taking on your own journey and trying something that may help you that your physician may not support or just know enough about. So go on the Department of Health website, see the doctors in your community, and go to them. And there's also doctors here throughout the day that you can go ahead and ask questions and maybe even make an appointment for your future visit. Okay, uh, Skip, how are we doing on time? We can wrap up whatever and take a break the Great, so if, if we got most of our questions answered, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for a little bit, take a break, and